Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Leila, the Lenormand Reader. And today I want to have a look at the Game of Hope deck, which is also called the Ur Lenormand in German, the Lenormand original in French, and the Primal Lenormand in English. And it is also called Das Spiel der Hoffnung. This means the Game of Hope or Le Jeu de l'Espoir in French. So the Game of Hope is a pretty famous deck of 36 cards because it is so clearly associated with the Lenormand Petit Jeu. So it is known to be the origin of Lenormand's deck. No, it was not Mademoiselle Lenormand who created this deck. She created the method of divining with the deck uh, very likely, and we still don't know that for sure, but the deck itself and the structure of the deck and the symbols on the deck was already present. So let's have a look at what's inside this deck. And I want you to know also that I have a detailed blog post that gets into the deck as well. So I'm going to link that for you to have a look at as well. The thing that stands out when you look at this deck is the size. So the box is large and the cards are large much larger than most of the Petit Jeu uh, decks that we are familiar with. The deck comes with um, a guidebook here and what is important about the guidebook is that it is written by someone who is not the original author of the deck but within it you will find the section that was originally written uh, by uh, Johann Kasper Heschel, who created this deck, or who supposedly did. So the guidebook in modern times comes in three languages. It comes in German, French, and English. And the last one is the one in English. When we open up to it, you see that we have the anchor as the card that illustrates it. And that's because the anchor is a key card in the game itself. So the actual uh, guidebook is written by someone called Alexander Gluck and Johann Kasper Hestel, who originally wrote the guidebook, has the section of that original guidebook in here. It is printed in a slightly different uh, print and it is like a section within the uh, guidebook itself. So it covers the game, how to play the game, and it also covers um, a suggestion for how to read the deck as a fortune telling deck. So it's pretty straightforward in terms uh, of the guidebook for Heshtel. And then on top of what Heshtel sub uh, wrote back then, Alexander Gluck added some notes about the original publication and also the meaning of the cards when it comes to divination with the cards. Um, so divining with the cards was covered by Heshtel but the meaning of the cards themselves wasn't. This is added by Alexander Gluck in the modern day, um, in the modern day guidebook here. So let's have a look at this deck. Let's see what, is, uh, what it looks like. You might have seen me play with it in some of the pick a card readings um, and uh, used it with other decks as well. So I've got the deck ordered in the one through 36 cards. So the number one here, number two, and so on, all the way to 36 is the card number. And then we have two insets and we have the main symbol of the card. Now we are all familiar with the hearts, the diamonds, and the spades. This is another heart, but the game of hope has an inset that we're not familiar with. These are the German deck insets. We have hearts, we have bells, and we have leaves, and we have a fourth one that is acorns. This is an acorn. We'll go through the cards and they will be clearer. The German deck is another one of those decks that was circulating at the time. It is not known why the Game of Hope has these two insets specifically. When it came to Lenormand, we have the red owl that covers uh, the pips and the blue owl that covers uh, the, the quotes. So these are the insets we're familiar with. But the Game of Hope has the German, um, the German uh, decks. 
And what's interesting about the German deck is that it doesn't start at one, it starts at two. Um, so the pips in the German deck are two, and then six to 10, and then the page, the queen, and the king. Whereas the regular pips that we're familiar with, with Lenormand, are one, the ace, and then six to 10, and then page, queen, and king. And one card where this stands out pretty clearly is the sun card. So I'm just gonna fish out the sun card. It's card 31. We have the ace of diamonds and the two of bells. So we start at one here and the German deck starts at number two, which is in this case, the two of bells. So let's go through the deck in a card by card so that you see the illustrations in case you're interested in this deck. And I have a link for it where you can purchase it and uh, examine the illustrations one by one. So this is the rider. This is the clover. The ship. The house. The tree. The clouds. Notice here, there doesn't seem to be a dark and a light side. In a lot of the Lenormand Petit Jeux, there is a dark and a light side. And it's said that the light side is things improving and the dark side is things getting more nebulous. This is the snake, the coffin. There seems to be a little burn spot on the coffin. This is part of the print here. This is not my burn spot. It seems to be from the original deck that was actually donated by a woman back then um, to a museum. She was keeping the collection. So you can check the blog post for these details. This is the flowers, the scythe. I really like the hourglass in here because it is an indication of time. Um, this really reminds me of an art form that is focused on representing the passing of time and the idea of death. You'll find a lot of skulls and the hourglass associated with this art. Um, this is the whip. It's a, a pretty aggressive card in my opinion. It looks like spots of blood on here. <laughs> it's uh, pretty impressive. This is the bird. Notice this is a single bird. A lot of petit jeux represent the bird as two, two birds and it often represents a pair. This is the child. This is the fox and the bear. And here is the star. This is a stork catching a frog, the dog, the tower. And here's another spot looks like a burn spot or maybe a tear in the original deck. This is not my tear or my spot on this deck. This is a copy of it and it captures the original spot. This is the garden and the mountain. This is the road. Notice the cross here. It looks like um, a cemetery or is this a tombstone? It's interesting. And there is also a little cross on this side. I wonder if it's a shadow. It's quite a curious representation. And the road is typically associated with changes and crossroads. So I think the cross also brings up this idea possibly. This is the mouse nibbling at what looks to me as some kind of piece of meat here. And the heart. This is the ring, the book, and the letter. This is the gentleman or the man, the lady or the woman. Notice that they are either facing each other or in the back of each other. Sometimes people read the symbology in the cards. This is the lily and the sun. And here is the moon and the key. This is the fish and the important anchor in the game of hope. And finally the cross. So as you can see, the illustrations are pretty clear. So I think it's a pretty good deck in the sense that it's, it's easy to immediately pick out the symbol. Uh, the background is clear. The colors are not very bright. 
but I think it's still a nice deck to use because I personally like it when there isn't too much clutter on a card or too much background and that when the illustrations are not too elaborate because it allows you to immediately see the symbol. Some decks really add a lot of detail and the main symbol can sometimes get lost in all of that detail. And um, here it's not the case. I think the, the symbols stand out very clearly uh, in the cards. And it's also a nice size, as far as I'm concerned, a little bit big, um, especially if you're doing a tableau. But it is comfortable to see, and I think uh, that's uh, a reason why I've incorporated it in my pick a card readings on the channel. So this is the deck, and um, this is the, the way it is structured uh, with the German deck uh, pips as well as the regular pips. Next, I want us to go through an actual game, how to play the Game of Hope, because it is actually a game. And uh, you might enjoy playing this with your family, with friends. Um, so stay tuned. Let's get into the Game of Hope and see how it is played. Okay, so here we are with the whole deck laid out in a grand tableau of nines in the order of the cards. So starting from number one, the writer, all the way to 36. Now in the instruction guidebook by Heschel, it says to lay out the cards in a six by six grid, but this is not practical for video and most tables. And so I've opted to lay them out in a tableau of nines. This doesn't make a difference to the game. The idea is really just to go through the cards in the order that they figure in. But the six by six idea actually inspired me to create a grand tableau uh, that I've called the Tableau of Hope that is laid out in a six by six grid. And this six by six geometry has interesting uh, structures within it that make the tableau, um, you know, more or less unique. I've got it covered in the blog post, so I really encourage you to have a look at it and maybe try your hand at uh, the six by six Tableau of Hope. For the purposes of the game, this is fine. The cards are laid out in order from one to 36. Any number of people can play. I'm just gonna play against myself to demonstrate how the game is played. So I am going to use two marks for this. I've got a tiny tarot deck in a box and I have a pomegranate made of bronze. So these are the two marks to represent the players. We're gonna set them on card number one, ready to start. Something else that we need for the game is cash. Um, so the, the idea is to use beans or coins or whatever. I don't have beans or coins, but I do have some collectible coins that I've kept over the years that I'm gonna use for the purposes of this game. At the outset, every player uh, pitches in a few coins into the pot um, because what happens is that players can get money out of the pot, but they also might end up paying into it as they go through the cards, depending on what card uh, they land on. The key thing about the Game of Hope is that different cards have different instructions. Not all of them do, but many of them do. So what happens is, as the players move through the deck and they land on different cards, they might be asked to do things uh, based on the instruction of the card. Sometimes the card will disadvantage a player and set them back a few steps, or they might move the player a few steps, or perhaps something else happens. And something else that Heschel uh, suggests is that for the cards that don't have an instruction, the people playing the game might come up with an instruction. And this includes fun things like singing a song or maybe daring someone to do something. Uh, you know, the idea is really just to create an atmosphere of fun. So that is a key thing about uh, the game. Another key thing is that landing on the anchor is uh, the goal. And this is what wins the game. So if a player lands on the anchor, th that player wins the game. There is something that could happen is that if a, a player moves past 36, they have to go back. And if someone lands on card 35 from coming back, it is not considered a win. And the person who wins seems to take all of the cash. This is not made in an express way in the, in the guidebook. Uh, Heschel says, also, it is not possible to take the cash box by counting back in, in excess of 36, but only in the advanced movement. So this is the sentence where it sounds like the person who wins collects the cash. But again, if you've landed on 35, um, 
by going backwards, you don't win and you don't get the cash. It is only through forward movement when you land on 35 that you collect uh, the cash and win. We're also going to need a pair of dice. Uh, so this is what is thrown to move forward in the game. And we can also use the dice to decide who starts. So let's say tarot throws three and pomegranate throws two. So tarot is going to start. So with this, we're ready to play the game. Let's go ahead. So tarot starts and we move forward by counting the card that we're on. Moves by seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. On the snake. I believe the snake has an instruction. It says, the, to stay safe from the bite of this dangerous snake, three marks have to be paid. So this is an example where the tarot player has to pitch in three into the pot of cash. Let's move on to pomegranate. Nine. One all the way to nine flowers. There is no instruction associated with the flowers. So now it's Tarot's turn. Eleven. One, starting with the card we're on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Landing on stork. Seventeen. There's no instruction for the stork. Moving on to pomegranate. Eight. One, starting with the card they're on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's the star. There is an instruction for the star. It says, arriving at the star of good prospects, the player receives six marks. So you see how the instruction of the cards start to hint at the divination aspects of the cards. It says that the star is a, a star of good prospect. So this wish fulfillment association and positive uh, energies that we associate with the star and divination is captured in here. And through number 16, uh, pomegranate would receive six marks out of the pot. Let's move on to tarot. Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven. This is the mouse. Is there an instruction for the mouse? No, there is not. Moving on to pomegranate. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. There is an instruction for the mountain. It says, on these steep alps, the player has to remain until another arrives to release him or he has to cast a double. So it looks like pomegranate is going to be stuck on here until uh, they get a double unless tarot somehow goes back uh, to this spot. So moving on to tarot. Five. One, two, three, four, five. The letter. There is an instruction for the letter. Whoever receives this letter has to pay a fee of two marks for the bearer. So it's like the delivery fee, right? And so tarot would have to pay two marks into the cash pot. Let's see if pomegranate casts a double. Nope. So it's back to tarot. Eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And they just missed the anchor. Is there an instruction for 34? Reaching the fish, one has to pay two marks. This is interesting because normally when we interpret the fish, it's about receiving money. It tends to be uh, more abundant um, in that receiving sense. Um, so reaching the fish, one has to pay two marks. So tarot would have to pay two into the cash pot. Now this is going to be interesting on how tarot is going to win the game. Let's see now if pomegranate gets out of the mountain. 11. Nope. So it's tarot and tarot is going to have to move back. I think that is six, one, two, three, four, five, six. 33. Yes, there is an instruction for 33. On reaching this key, one receives two marks. So tarot would have to receive two marks. I think tarot is going to be stuck here for a while. Let's see if mountain gets out of, um, pomegranate gets out of the mountain and that's a five and it's a no. Tarot, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So tarot is back at 30. There is no instruction for the lilies. 
Oh, here's a double for, for pomegranate getting out of the mountain. So one, two, three, four. And the heart has an interesting instruction. It says, whoever wins this heart will immediately offer it to the young gentleman at number 28 or to the young lady at number 29. That is to say, if the player arriving at card 24 is a woman, she will move up to 28 the man. And if it is a man, uh, he will move up to 29. So that is interesting and it starts to tell you about the divination aspects of uh, the cards and also highlights the importance of the man and the woman. I'll move pomegranate to the man and let's see if tarot wins this time around. Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Unfortunately, tarot has arrived at the cross so near to the luckiest field, which is the anchor, the player is cheated as against his will. He has to advance one step too far to the figure of the cross where he has to remain until another player takes this burden off him or he throws a double. So again, you see that through the game, we're starting to see the meaning of the cards uh, where Heschel says where he has to remain until another player takes this burden off him and this is where we have uh, the idea of burdens and obligations and duties weighing on the cross and it is part of the meaning of the cross let's see if pomegranate wins the game seven one two three four five six seven on the fish and we said the fish one has to pay two marks so pomegranate would have to pay two into the cash pot six one, two, three, four, five, six. 31. There is no instruction for 31. Back to pomegranate. Nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And no instruction for lilies. So back to the tarot. It looks like they're going to be here for a while. Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now this is a backward step onto the anchor, so this is not considered a win, unfortunately for tarot. Let's see if pomegranate gets it. Five, one, two, three, four, five. On the fish where they have to pay two marks. Back to tarot, five, one, two, three, four, five. On the key, one receives two marks. So here tarot would receive two out of the cash pot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's no instruction for the moon. And then tarot, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And no instruction for the sun. Six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Again, this is a backward step, so it's not winning the game. You have to land on the anchor through the forward movement. Eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Looks like they're gonna be here for a while. One, two, three, four, five, six, and we said no instructions for the moon. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. This is not a win again. And one, two, and three. So here the tarot wins because it landed on the anchor through the forward movement. So this is considered winning the game. And so tarot would take the cash. Now it doesn't say in the instructions how the rest of the players are uh, calculated in terms of scoring. If it's uh, the one who has the most money after the winner is considered the second uh, one uh, to win and the third and so on. That's not really expressed in the, in the guidebook. You might wanna come up with these rules yourself. So this is how the game of hope is played. You can take actually any deck and uh, lay it out in a 36 card deck and then assign uh, these instructions to the different cards 
or you can use your Lenormand deck and play with family and friends and then come up with other instructions for the cards if you want to have more fun with it. And do have a look again, like I said, at that six by six tableau that I created. It's a super interesting way of doing a tableau. It is in the blog post. And also, if you have any questions about the Game of Hope or any suggestions or thoughts, leave them for me in the comments. I'm happy to respond. So thank you again for tuning in and stay tuned for the coming videos together. Thank you so much for watching.